primary night in five states. But the real question tonight, how powerful is Donald Trump's influence? Tonight, the first big primary contests of the year. Insurgents taking on the establishment. Center stage, Pennsylvania, where the race for the Republican Senate nomination between TV's Dr. Oz. So we have to unify Republicans more than ever in this election cycle. And former hedge fund manager David McCormick has seen a sudden last minute surge from the Trumpiest of candidates, Kathy Barnett. Cancel culture is real. I'm experiencing it and it's not coming from the left right now is coming from the right. In the GOP race for governor, another Trump-like candidate, Doug Mastriano. We need somebody who's not afraid to stand up to the left. Leads former Congressman Lou Barletta. The stakes in this election couldn't be any higher. On the Democratic side, the Keystone State's Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman. I believe Democrats need to vote like Democrats to get things done. He's leading early favorite Congressman Connor Lamb and State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta. The other big Senate race, North Carolina, where Trump favorite Congressman Ted Budd. I'm the America first candidate. Seems poised to top the establishment favorite, former Governor Pat McCrory for the GOP nomination. We need to save the American dream. I'm a Ronald Reagan conservative. How many Trump-like candidates will win tonight? And are they too extreme to win in November? Also, primary contests in Oregon, Idaho, and Kentucky. Complete coverage of Decision 2022 and the biggest primary night of the year so far starts right now. This is a Meet the Press election night special. Live from Washington, here are Chuck Todd and Kristen Welker. Nothing gets me more fired up than the music. That's right. It's pretty good. Good Big evening. Night. I'm Chuck Todd alongside my partner here, Crispin Walker. Welcome to it. another special night of NBC News election coverage right here at NBC News Now. Coming to you live on what has been the biggest primary night of the year so far and perhaps the most consequential primary day we're going to have ahead of the midterm elections. That's right, and polls are closing. Results are coming in as we speak. It's a big night ahead, so we do want to dive in. Tonight, voters are casting their ballots amid a battle for the future of both political parties and what sort of candidates voters want to see on the ballot in November and beyond. But especially in focus tonight is the power of Trumpism inside the Republican electorate. Perhaps Trumpism is no more important than Trump. That's right. Uh, in Pennsylvania, a state that could decide, could Control of the Senate in November. Polls have just closed. And here we have a far right, so called the ultra mega candidate now, Kathy Barnett, has been surging in the polls in the last week for the Republican Senate nomination. Basically, an out of nowhere candidate. She's up against former President Trump's endorsed candidate, Mehmet Oz, obviously of TV fame, Dr. Oz, and the former hedge fund CEO, David McCormick. Two of them weren't really Pennsylvania natives until the start of this race. Our NBC News election desk is characterizing the race right now as simply too early to call. And the other big Republican race we're watching in Pennsylvania is the primary for governor, where far-right firebrand Doug Mastriano has been leading in the polls. He was just recently endorsed by Trump just a few days ago. Mastriano has been subpoenaed for documents and testimony by the House's investigation into the January 6th insurrection. And you know, it's been fascinating there. Very quick, if we could uh, let people know that Mastriano and Barnett have actually been working together as a ticket. Barnett right. on the Senate side, Mastriano on the governor's side. This has been going on for weeks and you know at first it looked like Barnett was essentially dragging off a of Mastriano yeah. and now the two may be helping each the other. The two have been surging and it Absolutely. certainly helped her in these final days. Meanwhile we have the future the Democratic Party is on display tonight in Pennsylvania as well where the self-described populist and cargo shorts wearing John Fetterman has so far outrun the more traditional Democratic field in the party Senate primary and it may prove to be a common theme tonight on the Democratic side and whether or not voters are looking for fresh messengers regardless of where they come from as President Biden struggles in the polls and the Democratic Party brand is at an all time low according to our NBC News poll. And for what it's worth right now, that race is still deemed too early to call. And in Fetterman's race, an unexpected health scare has shaken things up. We've been reporting on this for days now. Fetterman will not be at his own watch party mm -hmm. tonight, Chuck, after suffering a stroke. And late this afternoon, the Fetterman campaign saying he underwent a successful procedure to implant a pacemaker to regulate his heart rate. They say he is recovering at the hospital. Look, uh, this is a actually a fair, it is a fairly standard procedure. I I've had important something to say. in in my family that, that has gone about this and, and putting in, regulating that heartbeat does actually stop these uh, stroke uh, symptoms. Yeah. So this is a, a very common procedure. We also have a couple of early calls 
in North Carolina in that big Senate race on the Republican side. Didn't even make it a half an hour. The Trump-backed Congressman Ted Budd defeated former Governor Pat McCrory quite handily. It's another battleground state, though. Is the GOP going to be leaning a bit too far to the right come November? It's something we'll be watching with Bud's opponent. That's right. And of course, we did expect Bud to win. But as you say, Chuck, this was quite early in the night. Bud is going to take on former North Carolina Chief Justice Sherry Beasley, who the NBC News decision desk can now project as the Democratic Senate nominee in North Carolina. Look, this is going to be one of the big nine Senate races we're following. North Carolina will be deciding control of the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, we also got races uh, tonight out of Oregon, Idaho, Kentucky, everything from a scandal-plagued Republican congressman uh, one of the final blue dog Democrats facing a challenger from the left. We could see a couple of incumbent members of Congress lose tonight. Look, we we have a really, really, really unpopular, uh, uh, two unpopular parties these days. So right. don't be surprised if we see some incumbents go down. Yeah, voter dissatisfaction is high. And do not forget, this is the first round of primaries since voters have digested that dramatic leak of a draft opinion from the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. We will see how that plays out at the polls. Two parties, two different sets of challenges. Both candidates look to pick up candidates they hope will give them the best shot at victory this November. So settle in for the next couple of hours, at least, as we cover primary night in America. So, Kristen, let's set the stage here a little bit. I, I do think we were talking the backdrop to this. 75 percent of the country thinks we're heading in the wrong direction. That was our NBC News poll. And if we end up with Kathy Barnett and John Fetterman tonight, even if they come up short, the fact that they are basically the front runners going in tonight, that actually does fall in line with the polling we're seeing, which is don't give me traditional politicians. Don't give me that. Right. Give me something different, whether you're progressive, a liberal, a moderate, or conservative or ultra mega. Yeah, Kathy Barnett is unapologetically so. Interestingly, John Fetterman has started to moderate himself a, a little bit as he sort of eyes the general election. I, I do want to go back to what we just said. This is the first major primary night in the wake of that leaked draft of the Supreme Court decision, which uh, suggests they may be poised to overturn Roe v. Wade. What will that mean for turnout on both sides? Mm -hmm. And Barnett's last minute surge, Chuck, you have to think in part is because she is unapologetic when it comes to the issue of abortion. She opposes abortion in all cases. She says she was a product of rape. So. Look, uh, two months ago, when I, when you and I, when, when I told you we were going to be doing this special, yep. I thought we'd be spending as much time in North Carolina tonight mm -hmm. as we are in Pennsylvania. Right. We knew Pennsylvania was going to be hot. Uh, we thought a sitting governor in Pat McCrory. We yes. hope to be speaking with uh, former Governor McCrory uh, sometime in, in the next hour or so, um, that this would be a much, uh, uh, a much a much closer race, yeah. but there is something that happened here that we didn't see, which is Trump and the Club for Growth mm -hmm. were on the same side. They were all for Ted Budd. Which has not happened in a lot of these races, Correct. Chuck. Club it, for Growth has opposed Trump's endorsement. In fact, former President Trump has been quite upset about that. And Club for Growth is with Kathy Barnett late right. in Pennsylvania. Right. They've been a, they were split in Ohio. Um, it is interesting when they're split, somebody loses. That's right. Trump or club. That's right. And, and she has been outspent in this race, Kathy Barnett. The fact that she has that infusion of cash is certainly helping her out. I, I just want to make the note that the White House sees Pennsylvania as its best chance for a pickup state. And so I think one of the things I'll be watching for tonight, does mm -hmm. anything change that? Yeah. Who are the two candidates well, who emerge in the Senate? Oh, they want oh, Barnett. They want Barnett. They'll take Oz. Yes. They'll take Oz or Barnett. But the only more, candidate they don't yes. want is McCormick. Yes. They were Jack, the idea that it might be more complicated. She is an African-American conservative mother of two. We'll have to see. Still a battleground state. Mm -hmm. And the red and blue jerseys in Senate races can be awfully, awfully important. We're going to hear from our reporters covering the two big Senate primaries in a moment. We'll talk with Dasha Burns, who is with Kathy Barnett's team in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. But first, let's go to Sahil Kapoor. He's with the Fetterman campaign in Pittsburgh. So, Sahil, look, um, this has uh, been an odd ending to this campaign. I'm sure people have been concerned. Uh, unfortunately, I'm familiar with the, uh, with the uh, issue that Mr. Fetterman is dealing with. And the good news is there, there are plenty of tools, and he should be uh, uh, to be able to recover 100%. 
That's right. Hey, Chuck, Kristen, I'm at the Fetterman election night party here in Pittsburgh, where the candidate is not here. He is in the hospital, resting on orders from his doctor and his wife, Giselle Fetterman, uh, who cast a ballot today, this morning, in Braddock, Pennsylvania, his hometown. Now, she says he is doing well. They expect a full recovery. They insist, John Fetterman and Giselle Fetterman insist that his campaign is not slowing down. They expect to win this nomination, and they expect to move forward to the general election. You are absolutely right, Kristen. Uh, many other Democratic operatives I speak to see this seat, Pennsylvania, this state, as their best opportunity to pick up uh, a Senate seat in what is likely to be a grim political environment. It is an open seat, of course, vacated by the retiring Senator Pat Toomey. This election night party behind me is just getting started. Um, uh, Fetterman has been the front runner since the beginning of this race. He uh, jumped out to an early lead. He amassed an enormous amount of money and solidified himself as the man to beat. It appears, based on the polling, that neither of his rivals has been able to get close to him in the polls. His main rivals are, of course, Connor Lamb, a congressman who represents this area, and Malcolm Kenyatta, a state rep representative over in the Philadelphia area. Neither of them has made his health an issue here. They've nothing. They've done nothing but wish him well. And uh, one of them, Kenyatta, said he expects to see. Fetterman soon looks forward to that on the campaign trail. We'll wait to see what the results are, but yeah. his rivals, Fetterman's rivals, are hoping for a miracle. Fetterman is in the driver's seat to win this nomination, barring a, a shocking twist sometime tonight, Chuck. And Sahil, I mean, Fetterman did, he is, he is trying to cast himself more as sort of where the mainstream of the Democratic Party is, basically saying, hey, whatever you thought of was progressive, I'm in the mainstream, and he's rejecting some labels here. It seems to have worked. He is certainly an idiosyncratic figure. He's running as a different kind of Democrat. That's his, uh, a, a, an argument that he used in a recent ad. Now, you don't describe yourself as a different kind of Democrat unless you think that the typical Democrat this fall is not going to be a particularly good brand. But Fetterman, uh, for his part, is, uh, has an idiosyncratic set of positions. He supports legalizing marijuana. He supports a federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. But recently, he spoke out uh, against the Philadelphia reimposition of the mask mandate, which didn't last very long. He spoke, out, he spoke out against President Biden's decision regarding immigration and ending the Trump-era Title 42 policy. Both of these uh, came uh, against the left of his party. So he and is fracking. positioning himself as a Let's unique kind of Democrat, fracking. and his strategists say he is difficult. Exactly. That, too. He, he is, his yeah. campaign is describing him as someone who is difficult to label, and they believe that will be his key in the general election. Yeah, no, it is. Yeah. It has been it has worked for him now. Yeah. At Sahil, thank you. you. know, a lot of people say that his wife, Giselle, also helped to garner support, particularly in these final days. So we'll go back to Sahil a little bit later on in the broadcast. But for more now, I'm joined by Anna Palmer, founder and CEO of Punchbowl News, an MSNBC contributor, and Joshua Johnson, host of Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, right here on NBC News Now. Great to have you both with us. Um, Anna, I want to start with you. React, if you will, to the results that we have so far. Ted Budd, not a surprise in North Carolina. Um, fits into this broader sort of thesis that Chuck laid out at the top. This is an electorate that is dissatisfied. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think right now we haven't seen any big surprises where you're saying, wow, Democrat establishments should be feeling good about what's happening here, or Republicans who are in that establishment lane should feel good. Really, Trump has done well so far. I think one of the races that I think is key to watch, though, is going to be in North Carolina. Madison Cawthorn, the congressman who's been embattled recently, is down uh, 27 to 38 percent in some of these early numbers coming in on that race. Uh, certainly, the establishment, North Carolina Republicans, have turned against Cawthorn. So, just another kind of twist in this potential uh, outcome here of where you had a, a Trumpian, you know, maybe even further Trump than Trump himself, Madison Cawthorn, really struggling right now in some of these early numbers. Of course, the uh, election day votes aren't in yet, so we'll see if that ends up holding. But just another race that we're watching really closely. Yeah, we should remember with Madison Cawthorn, the guy was district shopping. I mean, he's done so many things to undermine himself that I, I, I don't know how— getting into trouble with the law. Yeah, I don't know so. how much of this you put in Trump yeah. or any of that. Joshua Johnson, I want to talk about John Fetterman. And, mm -hmm. and what we're likely to see the rest of this week, there's going to be real questions. He's going to become sort of the, it's going to be very similar to what we saw, I think, with Barack Obama in 2004, where a lot of people are going to come in from the outside and say, who is this guy? Is he the future of the Democratic Party? Mm. 
Yeah, I, I think that, well, the Democratic Party is still trying to kind of chart its own future right now because there are a lot of diverse voices within the party. And that's not a bug. That's a feature. That's the nature of mm -hmm. Democratic politics today in contrast to Republican politics, which has fallen very squarely in line with Donald Trump. I mean, midterms, this is going to sound heretical, but I've always felt like midterm primaries are a little bit of an autopilot exercise. You say the right things to the voters. You already kind of know what they want. This year, for Republican voters in a lot of primaries, pro-God, pro-gun, pro-Trump, and what's up with trans people. Like, it's very much a script. Mm -hmm. Democrats are trying to figure out their script for November. John Fetterman's got a bit of a public profile, right? This big, tall guy with the bald head and the hoodie and the cargo shorts who's somewhere in working class Pennsylvania. But, oh, he seems to make sense. And I think in a year, where voters in our latest poll told us cost of living is their number one issue yeah. and where we know jobs in the economy feel like a fuzzy area for Democrats, people who have executive government experience like mayors, which he is a former mayor, governors might feel appealing, but also I don't know if that's enough to fire people up. We know Republicans have issues that are galvanizing them to the polls. I think Democrats have some that are increasingly galvanizing, but I'm yeah. not sure what John Fetterman's going to say if he's asked about Roe v. Wade or if he's asked about protecting yeah. transgender kids. Like, is that an issue if he prevails tonight? And it is still an if. Is that an issue that he can use to win over independents, especially voters who are not in Philadelphia, Erie, or Allegheny counties, who are away from the big cities, who might know him, like him, but they have questions about Roe v. Wade. Like, yeah. will that be enough to get jo him in the Senate, considering everything that's at, at stake in the Senate right now? And Joshua, you, you take me to my follow-up question that I have for you. You're talking about these candidates following a script. Look at Kathy Barnett, uh, who has, in some ways, uh, written her own script. And as Chuck was just saying, the White House would welcome a Kathy Barnett win. Is she more complicated, though, in a general election because of her biography than some Democrats would like to think? What do you make of that? That's a good question. I don't know if she's more complicated. I, I think it's shrewd of her to kind of let the two big candidates knock each other out and go, mm -hmm. you bleeding? Are you bleeding? OK, good. Stand aside. My name is Kathy Burnett, and here's my story. I mean, she didn't tell that story about her mother being raped until a Newsmax debate very, very recently. And mm -hmm. I think the fact that she is against abortion with no exceptions and has that personal story is very powerful. It's not going to win people over. But if you're the kind yeah. of Republican voter who says that this is a drop dead issue, if she prevails, I don't know what the Democratic candidate says to overtake her, and I'm not sure that enough of the American people are ready yeah. to move on that issue to switch to flip party lines. I think the last few weeks have thrown a lot of things very yep. much into, into chaos in terms of what could happen in November. Well, the, the one thing we want to warn our people at the White House, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. You never yes. know. Yes. Anna Palmer, it can't help but notice, Club for Growth and, and Donald Trump were on the same side in North Carolina Senate, and that was a blowout, and there's no drama. Um, not the same story in Ohio a couple weeks ago, obviously not the same story in Pennsylvania, not the same story in, in Alabama, which is coming up. Um, it, it's, it's hard not to notice that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think it's a key decision maker when you have both uh, Trump and Club for Growth going up against each other, putting a bunch of money into these races. Uh, just kind of the two key Republicans here in this in the Pennsylvania Keystone State just blooding each other, right? I mean, you have Dr. Oz, you have David McCormick. I think a lot of establishment Republicans uh, in Washington and certainly had hoped that McCormick would potentially prevail. Yeah, the the kind of Dr. Oz and the mold of this kind of fame TV uh, doctor who has very big name recognition and very Trumpian in a lot of ways. But when they aren't together, it is clear that there's some movement here where they can either beat each other up. And now you have Kathy Barnett kind of surging. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see when, when all of the dust settles after tonight, whether or not Club for Growth says, well, we stood by what we believe. So it's better to have done that than to have paired with Trump on some of these candidates. Uh, when the, the potentially you have a Kathy Barnett who a lot of people don't believe is electable statewide. Yeah. And Anna, by all accounts, Trump wins in some version in Pennsylvania tonight, even if the candidate that he backed, even if Dr. Oz doesn't win, Trumpism will have won. Does it suggest that in some ways the party is moving beyond Trump, that you need to almost wrap yourself in a bigger MAGA flag? 
I feel like that is the real narrative that we're seeing play out this week uh, in particular, where, and I think part of it's because Trump's going to take credit no matter who wins, right? Yeah. Whether mm -hmm. it is the Trump endorsed candidate or somebody in his likeness, uh, he's pulled back some of endorsements because he just wants to win. But I think what you're really seeing play out, we see this play out in Congress every day, where oftentimes now some of these members that have been elected since he was president are further in that Trump vein than even the former president. And they're kind of pushing him to get in line with where they are at, uh, oftentimes even more so than where his policies might end up. Hey, Joshua, you know, it's interesting is while we're seeing most Republican primaries do what you said, they're, they're all moving further and further to the right, all very much trying to echo each other and how they try to rally Republican primary voters. It is not as uniform with progressives on the left and sort of the, 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 the sort of, I guess, your rank and file Democrats. We're seeing in some places progressives can do well, but in some of these other places, the quote establishment, there is, it is not the same level of, uh, of drive, if you will. It's definitely base driven on the right with Trumpism taking over the party. You don't quite see that uh, on any of these Democratic primaries, not as quite as uniform. Well, I think what, <clears throat> excuse me, I think what Democrats and Republicans are looking for right now are going to be rather different. I mean, we've talked about in the past about how Republican politics has been able to coalesce and advance without a clearly articulated platform, right, on what to do about an array of different issues. They didn't even I have think, a platform. Right. In I, exactly. Yeah. They just kind of copy pasted from 2016. But you've got a different kind of conversation on the Democratic side, particularly because a lot of the issues that Democratic voters have been excised about jobs, the economy, police brutality, abortion rights, mm -hmm. LGBTQ rights issues are not problems with easy solutions, but they're things that the Democrats have said we are able to enact policy on. We're able to create jobs. We're able to deal with social issues. Now Democratic voters are saying, great, show us how. It's a different mm -hmm. narrative on the other side of the aisle. All right, Anna Palmer, Joshua Johnson, thank you for starting us off tonight. Really appreciate it. Stick around because we're going to check back in with you. Coming up, as we mentioned, it is Judgment Day for Republican Congressman Madison Cawthorn in North Carolina. As we just showed you, he's trailing. He is, but it's very That's early. It. This is the early vote. You would assume those people would be the most against Cawth Cawthorn if he's getting the Trumpy type of supporter. They're an election day voter, so that's something we'll watch for. 30 percent is a number you got to circle there. There is a runoff rule in North Carolina. If no candidate gets over 30 percent, then the top two face off in a runoff. These string of controversies, though, we, we, we have a feeling there's no doubt there is a lot of discomfort of Cawthorn in this district. But again, as I said before, he was district shopping. He basically committed every sin an incumbent member of Congress mm -hmm. can, can commit. And uh, the fact that he's still marginally alive actually is quite remarkable. And Trump says, let's give him yeah. a second chance. We are streaming election night coverage. You're doing it right here from Meet the Press on NBC News Now. We'll be right back. from Ukraine, from Mayfield, Kentucky, from Waukesha, Wisconsin, to cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. I also want to get home. You'll get home. You'll get home. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Tough Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, it's here now. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from the Ground Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get a hand. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are 
Cats are ready for something like this. Come on. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. What comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. I that's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. We are back. We've had a few election calls. Ted Budd is the Republican nominee in North Carolina Senate. Sherry Beasley is the Democratic nominee in North Carolina Senate. We do have a call in Pennsylvania, which because the unopposed Democratic yes. candidate, Josh Shapiro, is now officially right. the Democratic nominee. No surprise there. We are waiting to see who he faces off on the Republican side of gonna things. Going to be close, going to be late, it's likely. Real 2024 yes. implications there. But let's stick mm -hmm. with Pennsylvania Senate. That is the marquee race of the night, particularly on the Republican side. Dasha Byrne, she's been all over this story, was all over the Kathy Barnett. Net surge before everyone else knew it was happening. She's in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania. So, Dasha, the one thing Kathy Barnett's campaign doesn't have is a whole bunch of tracking pollsters. So they're flying a little more blind than our than the folks at the Oz campaign or the McCormick campaign. What are they thinking? What are they seeing? What are they feeling? Well, look, uh, Barnett just walked in a few moments ago. The uh, event is just starting up here. We've got some introductory speakers. I'm sure she's going to speak shortly. Listen, uh, she's riding high right now. This campaign had absolutely no business being here at this point. Uh, this was a surprise to so many people, except Kathy, I'll tell you. She told us back in February that she was warning Republican insiders. She was warning the establishment that something else was coming. And you know what? To her credit, here she is with a a fraction of the money, a fraction of the resources, and you're right, they, they don't know where things are heading tonight, but the fact that they made it to this point is is really, uh, really significant, Chuck. As Oz has had the name ID, he's had the endorsement, uh, you've got McCormick, who's had just about every former Trump aide uh, on his campaign or endorsing him, and then you had Barnett, who was actually going into rooms and doing the MAGA talking points. She is perhaps the most MAGA candidate, despite her lack of... Uh, endorsements and Trump circle staff, right? Uh, and so tonight we're really seeing the culmination uh, of that, a room full of enthusiastic supporters tonight, Chuck. I don't know if I've seen... Yeah, and Dasha, one of the things you and I talked about is her biography is so powerful. Uh, African-American, mother of two. If she wins, she would be the first African-American woman that Pennsylvanians uh, send to the Senate. All right, Dasha, we are going to check back in with you in just a little bit. We appreciate it. We now want to do a deeper dive into North Carolina, where, as we mentioned, we're watching the district where controversial Congressman Madison Cawthorn is facing primary challenges in his district's Republican primary. NBC's Antonia Hilton joins us with the very latest from Hendersonville, North Carolina. Antonio, this is a candidate who is flawed by all accounts. He, of course, has the backing of former President Trump, who has not strayed. He says, let's give Madison a second chance. But this is a real test over an endorsement versus the quality of a candidate. What are folks inside his campaign saying? Right now, frankly, Kristen, the mood here is pretty calm. And frankly, his election night party behind me here is pretty sparsely populated. You know, Dasha was just mentioning people were starting to come out and get on stage. Nobody is saying anything here. And, you know, look, if he loses tonight, it's going to be a problem of his own making. That's what I've heard from Republicans here in the state, voters who I met today as people were coming out to the polls here in his home state, in his area. Look, it's been one controversy after another for him, from comments on a podcast about sex parties and cocaine use in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., to more recently leaked explicit photos and videos. And I talked all day to Republicans who were on the fence using words like immature, not sure if he's really ready at 26 years old to lead. I mean, I watched one guy stand for several minutes on the corner right in front of the precinct trying to make up his mind actively day of about whether he could really still support Congressman Cawthorn. He was considering voting for Chuck Edwards. And now what we're seeing in the early results, again, it's way too early to call, is that he's right. trailing behind the state senator, Chuck Edwards, here. And so, you know, this is a serious question. I mean, he had all the benefits of name recognition, being the incumbent and having Donald Trump's support. But it looks like this string of controversies has really hurt his reputation, not just with folks he works with in D.C., but with Republicans here at home. Antonio Hilton, it is, it is quite the rise and fall mm -hmm. so fast. 
he replaced Mark Meadows in Congress. Right. Now, he upset Mark Meadows' handpicked choice. Right. Uh, then Madison Cawthorn showed up at Trump's convention, which he was fairly excited about, which is why Trump got there. It is, uh, he is sort of, he, he, he sort of sidestepped his way in, yeah. and now it looks like he's going to end up being shown the door. We shall see. Thank you, Antonia. Tonight's first primary since voters learned of that, mm -hmm. that the Supreme Court could likely overturn Roe v. Wade. We don't know for sure, but that leak has penetrated the American public. It certainly has a real bombshell, and we're going to take a look at how that and other key issues like inflation, of course, what we talk about every day, could be playing at the polls. That's after a quick break. Defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? This is a very different kind of program. We're here to start conversation about the big things happening in our world. Professor, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but what do we think that the new normal is going to be? Is part of this that everyone's rethinking their jobs during this pandemic and their relationship to their employers? What is your biggest tip for any parent who's concerned about this? It's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Would it be easier for the airlines to manage a vaccine mandate than a mask mandate? Is there a case to be made that it's time to give Ukraine offensive weapons so they can win this war? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. NBC News, streaming free now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. Our players and coaches have been harmed. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, it's here now. Fire has grown uh, leaps and bounds. What you see behind me is typical. How you doing? Oh, pretty, pretty bad. Top Story with Tom Yamas is your news playlist on NBC News Now. And now, you can listen to it as a podcast. Available anytime and anywhere. Welcome back to NBC News, a special coverage of the midterms here on this key primary night. Polls are now closed in three of the five states holding primaries today. To break it all down, we are joined by Simone Sanders, host of Simone on MSNBC and Peacock and former senior advisor to Vice President Kamala Harris, and Brad Woodhouse, former communications director for the DNC, and a guru of all politics related to North Carolina, so the exact right person to talk to, and Republican strategist John Brabender, who served as senior strategist on former Pennsylvania Senator Rick Santorum's 2012 presidential campaign. Thanks to all of you for he being here. He doesn't have here. a horse in this primary, for what it's worth. Okay, important <laughs> to point out. Right. Simone, uh, let me start with you. Let's just take stock of where we are. No major surprises yet. You obviously have Ted Budd, who won um, in North Carolina. What are you going to be watching for, though, uh, in Pennsylvania, which is really right now sort of the center of the political universe? So I was just texting with some Pennsylvania Democrats, and I'm like, what are the streets saying? And the streets are actually saying that uh, folks are wondering if Connor Lamb could come in third. 
People might be surprised how Malcolm Kenyatta, a state rep currently from Pennsylvania, represents the Philly area, comes in. I'm going to be watching for, actually, I want to know how Kathy Barnett does. I am very, I'm very interested in what that looks like. I'm interested in not just, okay, uh, Pittsburgh and the Philadelphia numbers. I want to know what the, sub, what the suburbs and real rural parts of Pennsylvania are looking like, because I do think it's a good indicator of the fall. Um, and then also look forward well, to 2024. Do you think she could peel off some of the black vote if she makes it to the general? I, I think it really just depends. It, uh, potentially. I think more so, though, it looks like that folks would stay home as opposed to mm -hmm. vote for her. Interesting here, for what it's worth, we've been trying. I'm obsessed with to see how Philadelphia is going to break. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right now, Kenyatta's got 38. Uh, Fetterman's got 35. All right. So you know where the rest is mm -hmm. with, with, with Connor Lamb. The machine was with Connor Lamb. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenyatta had his own organization, and Fetterman's just sort of the rank and file Democrat. I think that tells you it's a, it's an interesting. The only question, and, and Chris and I have been talking about this, uh, and it's been brought up to me, including Mr. Kenyatta brought this up to me, is does does Fetterman get super predatored? And what he meant by that is they ran a super predator ad in Philadelphia, and it sat on turnout for Hillary Clinton at 16. I do think John Fetterman needs better answers. Look, I watched the debate um, that he participated in. I have seen a number of the interviews. I've seen interviews that Connor Lamb and both Malcolm Kenyatta have done. I do think that if John Fetterman is a Democratic nominee, he needs a better answer. Better answer for the incident that happened in 2013 yes. when he chased an African-American man. Uh, he says he didn't know the race of the man with a gun. Um, but this has become a flashpoint. He has not apologized. No, for this, he needs a, a better answer. Look, I, at this point, if I, I mean, and look, Brad is a guru here. I was just telling my <laughs> assistant out there, like, this is OG. Yeah. He needs a better answer. And I think anyone advising that campaign, if he comes out on top, he has to get his messaging right and then get into the community. I want to stay in Pennsylvania uh, here before we get to North Carolina. So let me bring in Mr. Braybender. No, no, we're just trying to give you a hard time. <laughs> so, John, look, you've been involved in so many races. And, you know, we were looking at this about two months ago. Uh, a lot of us wondered, OK, candidate A and candidate B are going to peel the paint off of each other. There is going to be room for a candidate C. Now, I'll be honest with you, I thought it would be Bartos or Carla Sands. It's turned out to be Kathy Barnett. Mm -hmm. um, you watch this unfold. How did Oz and McCormick blow this? Even well, one of them may end up winning tonight, I mean, but they put themselves honest, in You know, it. and I know yeah. both of them, but they didn't excite anybody. And as yeah. you know, Republican primary voters and Democrat primary voters are completely different animals than average voters. And they want to be excited. They want to say, I want to be passionate. And, you know, Oz, you know, people were just always a little suspicious. Is he really a conservative? And, and McCormick did a good job trying to convince people that he wasn't. McCormick just didn't create the energy, I think, that people were looking for. And once you get a surge from somebody a little bit late, it's like, oh, this is kind of exciting. You know, there's another element in Pennsylvania primaries that aren't true everywhere, is it also says where you are geographically from on primary day. And so mm. that's going to have some say in this. In fact, you can see in the early numbers, you're going to see McCormick's going to do well because Allegheny County is going to be where he's from and they're going to roll up big numbers. But you're going to run into that where, where Barnett and 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 uh, uh, Oz are both from the same geographic region. So there's a lot of other dynamics that are going to go on here. Yeah. And John, just quick follow up. Back in 2008, former President Obama won the state in the general election because Democrats actually outnumbered Republicans in the Philadelphia suburbs. We're now seeing Republicans with a big comeback. What, what are you seeing? How is that going to oh. impact the outcome? And they're not. They're, and basically, what's happened is it used to be where you had a large number of moderate Republicans in the collar counties of Philadelphia. Yeah. They're no longer there. Where the Republicans have actually picked up is a lot of sons and daughters of Reagan Democrats have switched to just become Republicans. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, mm -hmm. the Republicans have lost some of this traditional establishment uh, right. uh, sort of moderate vote. So it's why you're seeing sort of these dynamics, why Master on Master Annie and also uh, Barnett are, are appealing to these primary voters. It's going to be really interesting, particularly, I think, the Senate race, because it, you know, you have Featherman, who's sort of the Democrat Donald Trump, if you will. I mean, the guy showed mm -hmm. up in shorts to meet Biden in the middle of February, I think it was. You know, <laughs> and and so, you know, look, a lot of Pittsburgh Steelers fans are going to find that appealing, quite frankly. Yeah. I mean, let's not forget it. Or even in Philadelphia, where you know they were notorious for throwing snowballs at Santa Claus during an Eagles game, and everybody was cheering. I mean, you know, this is a little bit different state in a mindset. 
And I will tell you, you talk about ground zero for America to say, we're going to have the opposite ends of the spectrum going at it in the fall. Uh, that's certainly going to be the case. What I don't believe is these stories where they say, oh, this person has too many flaws. They're yeah. going to be problematic in the, in the fall. There are some elections where the environment just overwhelms the candidates. I agree with you. As of right now, this is one of those elections. I, I look, I think that's right. I don't think that Democrats should be singing, uh, counting this race mm -hmm. yet if Barnett is the Republican nominee. Brad, take us to North Carolina. I'm going to yeah, be honest mm -hmm. with you. There's quite a few um, quietly skeptical Democrats in Washington about North Carolina. They, they are treating the, they, they put the North Carolina Senate race in the same place they put Florida Gov and Florida Senate, that this Na the national environment makes it impossible. Are they well, right or wrong? I, look, I wouldn't. They're wrong. Okay. I wouldn't sleep on North Carolina. I mean, look how close. Uh, look how close it was in 2020. It was one point, uh, three point loss for Biden, and Biden wasn't uh, competing there. Competing there at the end. And I want you to think about how extreme the Republican Party has moved in North Carolina. Pat McCrory called himself this weekend uh, the, the first Ron DeSantis. He was Ron DeSantis before there was. He had the bathroom bill. He banned sanctuary cities. He is one of the most extreme governors, one of the most right-wing governors North Carolina has ever seen. And he's going to lose badly tonight yeah. to Ted Budd, who was endorsed uh, by Donald Trump, and Ted Budd, who believes uh, in the election lie. And so, it, you know, I think that extreme record, the fact that Trump is uh, going to be hanging out there as a, as a specter. And I think there's a lot of energy in the African-American com community. And after this leaked Supreme Court decision, a lot of, uh, a lot of energy. So you, you, it, 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 this should be an organizing tool in North Carolina? It, it should be an organizing tool in, Nor in North Carolina. Absolutely. Sherry Busy, look, she's won statewide twice. We have a popular uh, governor there who happens to be a Democrat. She's already talking about abortion. Yeah, and she's already yeah. talking about abortion. Yeah. I think it's going to be a big issue. Uh, I feel like I got smarter with the three of you. Yes. I really appreciate Great that. Panel. Simone, Brad, yeah. and John. Thank you. Well, well, we'll leave you out of it, Brad. <laughs> Up next, the polls are closed. Results are coming in. We're going to do a little more of an update here for you. Yeah, the one and only Steve Kornacki. He's at the big board, of course, with a look at what we know and what we don't. That's after a quick break. Fire has grown uh, leaps and bounds. What you see behind me is typical. How you doing? Um, pretty, pretty bad. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. Look who's back together. Oh, I'm so, so happy. And me. That's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Would it be easier for the airlines to manage a vaccine mandate than a mask mandate? Is there a case to be made that it's time to give Ukraine offensive weapons so they can win this war? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For the very latest results and analysis, we want to send it over to Steve Kornacki, who's at the big board. Steve, what do you got? 
All right, well, let's start in Pennsylvania here, and I think we could say something much more substantial about the Democratic primary here. You can see the Lieutenant Governor, John Fetterman, with that wide lead over Connor Lamb, and, and you can see geographically here, it's spreading from Allegheny County. This is Fetterman and Lamb's shared base politically, but it is Fetterman crushing Lamb by almost 20 points there. And then you go to the other side of the state. If you're Lamb, if you're not getting it in Western Pennsylvania, you want to make up for it in the Eastern part of the state, particularly the Philadelphia suburbs. But again, take a look. You're seeing like Montgomery County right here. This is one of the big ones. And again, it looks the same. Fetterman's up by almost 20 points. Bucks County, Fetterman's lead is more than 20 points. Uh, to be clear here, what we're looking at on the Democratic side right now, and NBC has characterized this as Fetterman is leading right now. We haven't called it yet. That's because what you're looking at right now basically is mail-in voting. And a lot of these counties, they count up the mail-in ballots uh, first and report them out first. So we're still waiting on the votes that were cast today. And that's really the only big variable here, I would say, left in this Democratic Senate primary. Is there any kind of a massive shift in the same day vote in Lamb's direction that could change this? But otherwise, the trajectory here clearly favors Fetterman. And the key, the other key, too, is when I say you're looking at mail-in votes here. We saw this story in 2020 in Pennsylvania more dramatically than any other state, and we're seeing it tonight. Democrats vote by mail at a vastly higher rate than Republicans. So we're expecting tonight that upwards of 50 percent of all the votes cast in the Democratic primary in Pennsylvania will end up being by mail. On the Republican side, that number is probably going to be closer to 10 percent. Let me just give you a sense of that disparity. So right now, this is what we're seeing in the Republican Senate race. OK, these are the statewide numbers. Notice how much smaller they're counting up votes in the same places, but they're counting up mail ballots. And the numbers are just much smaller on the Republican side than what we're looking at in the Democratic side. And that includes a take Montgomery County. This is on the Republican side. This is going to be, they're going to produce a ton of votes tonight. But right now, 3,320, there's about 10,000 votes on the Republican side that have been counted up in Montgomery County. It's just the mail ballots basically right now. When the same day comes in, you're going to see a ton more votes on the Republican side. And I think you've got a potential here for there to be a bit of a shakeup. You see, McCormick is doing well. What we can say right now, a couple things about McCormick. His base is Allegheny County. On the ballot, it says he's from Allegheny County. So you got some votes there from his base and from around his base in western Pennsylvania that are in. And he's doing well with the mail-in ballots. But there just aren't as many mail-in ballots, nearly as many on the Republican side as there are on the Democratic side. And the other place, obviously, where that's true, the Republican race for governor. Again, just not a ton of votes that have been counted up so far. We have seen this story in other Republican primaries, you know, Ohio, West Virginia, Nebraska. The Trump endorsed candidate, the Trump aligned candidate does so much better, we've been seeing, when they do the same day vote than the mail vote. So here's Doug Mastriano right now running under 14%. That's basically mail ballots. Let's see what happens there when we start counting up same day votes. All right, Mr. Kornacki, thank you. One other thing to keep in mind, Kristen, Connor Lamb is the candidate of the machine. Right. Well, now, what is left of the Democratic machine yes. in the state of Pennsylvania? I think we're finding out tonight that not a lot. And That's right. And I've been hearing from plenty of uh, uh, leaders of that machine how they've been sort of frustrated by their lack of influence. But it is worth watching uh, if Lamb's number gets a little bit better tonight in some of these places. It's because he had all of these sort of official establishment types behind him in most of, of the main parts of, of Southeast Pennsylvania. Right. No, you're absolutely right. And if we were having this conversation a couple of months ago, yeah. he very well may have been right. in the lead. And it kind of underscores the point that you made earlier, which is that Fetterman may be in a purple state like Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, what Democrats think has the best chance of actually winning in a general election. I'll tell you this about Barnett. You know, it's interesting here. There is not only not only is there not a lot of early vote in, in, in with Republicans yeah. right now in general, but right. Pennsylvania doesn't right. have this tradition more That's so right. than any others. That's right. Ironically, had this been North Carolina, where uh, it, Kathy Barnett never would have won. Yes. Kathy Barnett's right. chance tonight is simply because right. most of the voters haven't voted yet. That's a right. guy like, you know, Ted, either Ted Bud or McCrory can bank more votes. McCormick would have banked more votes right. in, a, in a, one of these states like a Florida or North Carolina. That's right. And they probably would have shielded themselves from this late search. It's a good point, And I think you have to think about who votes in the mail. Yeah. Seniors, people who don't right. want to go to the polls because Barnett's of COVID. already winning Montgomery County, by the right. way. Right. Yes. Sorry. Watch. That was, that to me, mm. that's a tea leaf. That's Worth right. reading right now. Keep we got a lot more ahead. Suburb. Keep it right here. Streaming election coverage with Meet the Press on NBC News Now.
Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Our world is facing some complex issues. Chuck Todd breaks them down. Every Thursday, a deep dive into a new subject. Instead of trying to cover a lot of topics in one episode, we're going to focus on one and take a deeper look at how it impacts America. Exploring and explaining the critical stories that affect our future. Meet the Press Reports. Thursdays at 10.30 p.m. Streaming on NBC News Now and on demand next day on Peacock. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. Our players and coaches have been harmed. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? When was the last time you made space to listen to somebody? What I learned from a very young age is radical love, radical forgiveness. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It showed a lot of personal strength for me. Why am I trying to make other people happy over myself? So many life lessons that are going on in these conversations. We're watching a transformation. Join Hoda Kotb for her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. You like election nights? We got election results. It is official. We've seen enough. Uh, as we like to say, John Fetterman, we are calling that race. It is John Fetterman, Democratic nominee now for the U.S. Senate. Uh, I have to tell you, Kristen, again, I go back just two months ago, the idea that we would be able to call this before 9 p.m., Connor Lamb, in many ways, the avatar of what I think the Biden folks thought would be what the new Democratic Party under yeah. Biden would look like. Yep. And instead, it's, it's John Fetterman. He's a guy that, that was always described as supporting Bernie Sanders, but he's sort of, look, he's paid his dues over the last six years. Yeah. He ran for the Senate, lost in, right. 90, uh, in, right. in 2016. Then he ran for lieutenant governor and won. One. Um, I think this is a case of sometimes voters reward people that sort of work their way up. And I think we shouldn't underestimate the fact that he is a traditional Democrat as far as Pennsylvania Democrat. He's a traditional Democrat. He doesn't look like a traditional no. politician. He wears sweatshirts. Uh, those who support him say that's part of his charm. And you're right. He supported Bernie Sanders in 2016. Ardasha Burns asked him if he considers himself to be a progressive. He said, I'm just a Democrat, mm -hmm. as he taxed to the middle, eyeing what the polls were showing, which has now come to pass, which is that he has won this primary. He's the projected winner this evening. Well, speaking of these progressive versus pragmatists, or however you want to call it, the progressives versus the, mm -hmm. the liberals, uh, we do have uh, an important new call in Kentucky. It's a House primary in Kentucky for what is going to be a likely new member of Congress. NBC News projects that Morgan McGarvey will win the Democratic primary in Kentucky's third district. This is the Louisville area congressional district that's being vacated by Congressman John Yarmouth. Uh, and so it is quite likely a safe seat come November. 
And look, when John Yarmouth got elected, mm -hmm. John Yarmouth was considered the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. He, as the party shifted to the left, Yarmouth became sort of suddenly the establishment. Uh, the establishment. <laughs> yeah. And we've had a lot of conversations about this. So it is. A, it has been fascinating to watch the party move. And, and Yarmouth has been one of my favorite ones to watch because he really hasn't changed, but the party has sort of party moved changed. much closer to him and, and actually to the further to the left of him at times. That's right. And, and I think we are seeing that same theme play out in many of these races. Now, we still have a number to call, so we'll have to wait and see uh, if it's consistent. But joining us now to break all of this down, two people who know a whole lot about politics, Pennsylvania, former mayor of Philadelphia, Michael Nutter, and GOP strategist Joe Watkins. Thanks to both of you for being here. And uh, Mayor Nutter, one of the first political campaigns I covered was as a local reporter in Philadelphia. Your race for mayor, uh, the night that you won. Uh, talk about, first of all, the fact that we have just said that John Fetterman is now the projected winner uh, of the Democratic primary in that state. Not a surprise, but he did suffer a stroke, which was undoubtedly a last minute twist in this race. Yeah. So first and foremost, obviously, um, wishing him, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman, uh, the best uh, with regard to his recovery. Um, I, I you know, only what I've seen in the, in the news reports, I don't know, you know, complete status, uh, but certainly um, first, uh, just hoping for his health. Elections are elections, but, you know, health and taking care of yourself is more important. Um, you know, look, we have a nominee. Uh, so um, as good Democrats, we should rally around our, our nominee, uh, holding on to uh, the Senate, uh, Senate majority, critically important, especially uh, in light of the uh, release, leak, whatever you want to call it, uh, of the uh, Supreme Court uh, draft uh, with regard to Roe v. Wade, but also so many critical issues uh, that uh, President Biden and the administration, the Senate, the House are facing. And, and so uh, getting good Democrats, uh, especially now potentially with a flip seat uh, in uh, Pennsylvania to complement, of course, Senator Casey uh, in Pennsylvania, so critically important. Uh, we need to rally uh, immediately uh, around uh, uh, Democratic nominee uh, Fetterman uh, and go on and win this race. Joe Watkins, you and I have seen a lot of Republican primaries in Pennsylvania. You seen one weirder than this one? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is one for the record books. We, we haven't seen anything like that ever. I mean, uh, you know, we, right up to the very end, uh, you, you just didn't know. And uh, folks that thought they had the support of President Trump found out, uh, some later than others, that they did not. Uh, and yet until they all uh, tried to hug him and stay close to him in the hope that that might help them with it. So this is a very, very different kind of a, a primary, Senate primary. And uh, where we're all the, the leadership uh, tried to stay close to President Trump, uh, in one case, uh, uh, one candidate running for governor, it was uh, McSwain, was rebuffed by the former president, who went and, went and said on Twitter, or well, not Twitter, but said it through social media, of all the people to vote for for governor, please don't vote for Bill McClain. But we'll mm. see if that has what effect mm. that has tonight. Um, he's not mm. being badly early. I don't, I don't, I don't know that he wins. But uh, he, he's done a lot of TV advertising, uh, much of which has been pretty effective in the southeastern part of the state. So we'll see if we'll see what the effect is of, uh, of the, the negatives that he's got. Joe, very quick follow-up to you. If Kathy Barnett does wind up winning tonight, a lot of Democrats I've heard have said that's exactly what they want because they think it'll be a shoe in for Fetterman. Um, you see this as slightly more complicated. What, if anything, do you think the impact might be on the African-American vote in Pennsylvania, particularly Philadelphia and the surrounding suburbs? Well, we're talking about a non-presidential election year and about an African-American woman who has a, a, a very authentic story. I mean, she came from poverty, abject poverty, uh, was, was born out of, a, out of rape. Um, uh, and and she, she talks uh, in a way that, that a lot of people, white and black, uh, really understand. I mean, the reason why she's done so well in this primary is because so many, her story has resonated with Pennsylvanians, uh, white Pennsylvanians primarily. Uh, but, but at the right. same time, some of the negatives that have been used against her, like the fact that she supported the George Floyd protests and, and the Black Lives Matter movement, those things will help her in a general election. And uh, uh, I wouldn't discount her at all. She's the nominee, and we don't need to yeah. know yet that she will be. She, she'll, she'll be upset by things. 
Michael Nutter, what does John Fetterman have to do to make sure Philadelphia doesn't sit on its hands in November? Well, you know, Philly is a is a, I mean, it's a maybe it's a different version of what uh, people used to say about uh, what is it? Missouri is a show me state. Uh, yeah. Philly mm -hmm. is a show up state uh, city, mm -hmm. rather, and 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 our suburbs. And so, you know, it's a full on all you know across the state race uh, but everyone knows uh, that uh, to win a statewide race in the general election uh, you have to show up show out uh, and be on uh, in philadelphia in bucks chester delaware montgomery county up through the lehigh valley uh, Harrisburg, uh, yep. a number of places around there, Erie and uh, Pittsburgh, Allegheny County. You have to do that. Uh, and I fully expect uh, that uh, Lieutenant Governor, uh, now uh, uh, nominee, Democrat yep. nominee, uh, will do, yep. uh, should do uh, those kinds of things. Uh, we Again, we need to rally around our nominee. Okay. The stakes are too high. All right, Michael Nutter, Joe Watkins, thank you for a great conversation. Meet the Press special election night coverage continues straight ahead right here on NBC News Now. Live from Washington, here are Chuck Todd and Kristen Welker. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kristen Welker alongside Chuck Todd. You're streaming Meet the Press primary election night coverage on NBC News Now. We're keeping an eye on a number of races across multiple states, already learning a lot mm -hmm. about where parties are headed as we get closer to November. We are at the top of the 9 p.m. hour out in the east. Our decision desk already has some characterizations in several key races. Let's run through them. That's right. At this hour, the NBC News decision desk projects that Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman will be the Democratic Senate nominee in Pennsylvania. The self-proclaimed populist in a hoodie and cargo shorts that beat the paragon of the establishment Democratic Party, Connor Lamb. And in the Republican Senate primary in Pennsylvania, the decision desk also says that a crowded race is too close to call. We could be here a while. Kathy Barnett's mm -hmm. ultra mega challenge against the Trump backed Mehmet Oz is still going on. David McCormick doing well with what early vote there is, but there's not enough early vote, it appears. But we shall see the actual election day vote finally starting to trickle in soon. As for the state's Republican gubernatorial primary, that race is also too early to call. Plenty of outstanding Republican votes in Pennsylvania. Expect that order to change quite a bit. Yep. And the winner. Of that race is already already knows who they're taking on. It's Pennsylvania's Attorney General Josh Shapiro, who won the Democratic nomination for governor unopposed. I could tell you this: this adds to why the White House feels so bullish on Pennsylvania. They think Shapiro can lead this ticket, especially if Doug Mastriano ends up, uh, who's an election denier and a January 6 attendee ends up with the Republican nomination there. That's right. The White House sees Pennsylvania as its best shot for a pickup state in the Senate as well. So as Chuck points out, uh, Josh Shapiro, they think, would help that ticket. And a couple of early calls tonight in North Carolina. NBC News projects former Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court will be the Democratic Senate nominee in the Tar Heel State. And our decision guest predicts that she's going to be taking on Congressman Ted Budd, the Trump-backed candidate who topped the establishment uh, choice there for a while, former Governor Pat McCrory, Ted Budd with a pretty resounding victory over McCrory in a race that just three months ago at times, McCrory was ahead. Yeah, we called that race in the first half hour of this show. And we're still following Madison Cawthorn's primary in North Carolina's 11th congressional district. No call to be made at this moment. He's a controversial candidate who's facing a lot of headwinds. It is worth noting the early vote, he was down 10. As Election Day vote has trickled in, the margin is narrowed. It's pretty clear there isn't going to be a runoff because yes. both the two top candidates are already now over 30%. But let's get into what we've learned so far and why it matters. Look, let's talk about. A lot of this primary night is going to be about how well does Trump do, how well does right. Trumpism do. North Carolina Senate had Club for Growth mm -hmm. and Donald Trump on the same side. Big win, sort of no problem. Now, Trump's behind Madison Cawthorn, not looking so hot. Trump's behind Dr. Oz, we don't know. Trump's behind the lieutenant governor in Idaho, that race doesn't look so good down the road. He's going to have a mixed night tonight. There's no doubt about that. He's going to have a mixed night tonight. Trumpism uh, will undoubtedly, I think, have a win in Pennsylvania. Gonna, Trumpism but is going to have a much better night. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. And I think that's where we are to some extent, yeah. where for some of these candidates, they are 
out trumping Trump. Um, look, I think the White House is watching all of these results come in very closely. I just said it. They see Pennsylvania as their best chance for a state to pick up in the Senate race. And now they know their nominee, uh, not a surprise, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, who initially had endorsed um, and voted for Bernie Sanders in 2016. He painted himself as a progressive. And now he's really starting to tack more toward the middle. Look, John Fetterman is going to become the most famous Democratic candidate in 2022. Mm. Okay, he is. There is going to be. First of all, he is. He is sort of his own brand, if you will, and that gets used a lot. But it does strike me. I wouldn't be surprised. Like, like an Illinois Senate nominee from 2004, mm -hmm. where every <laughs> reporter from around the country said, hey, "I'm going to go to Illinois." Right. In fact, a reporter, That's right. I, Fetterman is going to be the campaign, and if Dr. Oz somehow is a nominee, but regardless of who he faces, you're going to see. Oh, look. Uh, there's there's news people from Tokyo. That's there's right. news people from Denmark. You know, <laughs> right. It is going to be that race in the midterms. And, and I think this goes back to an essential lesson of politics, something that you've talked quite a bit about, Chuck, which is that personal stories matter. The strength of candidates matter. And we're seeing that play out with John Fetterman. And let's talk about his wife for a moment, mm -hmm. if we could. Giselle, uh, our Dasha Burns profiled her. She is a, a strong force in her own right yeah. and someone who's really invoked herself uh, on the campaign. Politics, trail. Giselle is going to yes. be John Fetterman, not Giselle automatically being Tom Brady. Right, that, right, the other Giselle. The other Giselle. <laughs> Which one are we going to be calling the other Giselle? Uh, in just the last couple of minutes, we've got an update for you in the Pennsylvania governor's race, the Republican race we are now cl classifying as too, uh, it's still too early to call, but we can now say that Doug Mastriano leads in that race. We're going to go now to two of our NBC News colleagues to check back in on both of those primary races. Vaughn Hilliard is with the Oz campaign. Dasha Burns is at the Barnett election night event. She'll be with us in just a minute. But Vaughn, let's take, uh, let's start with you. Look, we're already classifying Mastriano. Describe for me a little bit this sort of dual campaign that Mastriano and Barnett, they've been kind of working together for a while and all of a sudden Barnett caught fire. And they were both the two candidates that were outside the U.S. Capitol on January 6th here. They saw an opportunity for their campaigns to walk hand in hand around one fundamental issue. And that issue was the 2020 election. Doug Mastriano, we could talk a long time tonight, you guys, about who Doug Mastriano is here. But he is most likely going to be walking away. If the polls hold and reflect reality here tonight, he will be the Republican nominee. And Doug Mastriano, you know, he would be not only in charge of selecting the secretary of state here in Pennsylvania, who would oversee the 2024 election, Doug Mastriano would be in charge of certifying a potential 2024 president, uh, presidential election result here. Doug Mastriano, had, back in 2020, he was suggesting that the state legislature introduce a resolution to completely toss out Pennsylvania's 2020 election results and send a Trump slate of electors to be counted at the U.S. Congress on January 6th. This is a man who also uh, called for the essentially the wiping out of the voter rolls in Pennsylvania and requiring Pennsylvania residents to re-register to vote. That is who the likely Democratic or Republican nominee is here tonight. And then that what leads us here to the U.S. Senate race. And each of these candidates, right, we can go and I'll let Dasha go more into Kathy Barnett here. But Mehmet Oz, you know, has a good shot of pulling off a victory here tonight. It may be a few hours till we know these results here. But Mehmet Oz would expand the stable of loyalists that Trump has built here in 2022 already. You talk about Ted Budd in North Carolina. You're talking about Congressman Alex Mooney in West Virginia picking up a win one week ago. You talk about J.D. Vance two weeks ago in the state of Ohio. He'll have some losses along the way, but who would a Mehmet Oz or a Kathy Barnett or a David McCormick be replacing? More of this moderate Republican, Pat Toomey, the current Republican senator who is retiring. These are the stakes that we're seeing not only here in Pennsylvania, but also a around the country in terms of the candidates who the Republican Party is looking to put yeah. forward here, potentially. Vaughn, uh, Kristen and I are old enough to remember when Pat Toomey was considered a conservative and too far out of the mainstream to win statewide in, in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, Vaughn, i got to ask you about the Oz um, organization. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump's statewide organization in Pennsylvania was better there than in any other battleground state. Have you seen evidence that the Trump, the Trump folks have been able to reinforce Oz in the last 48 hours or not? 
Yes, and you know, I think it's important to note when we're talking about these campaigns, you have Mehmet Oz and you have David McCormick, both uh, political machines here. You have former Trump aides, you have former Cruz aides, you know, individuals who are essentially working not only up, uh, you know, door knocking lists over these last days, but also phone calls. You know, in so many campaigns, you have likely voters, these contact lists, who, you know, in those final days there, you have identified over the course of months, even a year, who is most likely to come out for you and who you need to show up to the polls. Kathy Barnett does not have that. I was talking to uh, a senior advisor for Kathy Barnett who actually showed up in town five days ago and hopped on last moment because uh, he admitted that they had no operation like that. They have no uh, phone list right. of who Kathy Barnett and who these volunteers should call up here. And yet, so I think it's important if she were to pull off a win tonight, what it says about the grassroots movement and the ability of these candidates, you know, to surge and get the word out over social media and beat back against tens of millions of dollars in the final days. Really important point and great reporting as always. Vaughn, thank you. Stick by the, around. By we'll the come Krista, back to I you. I can't help but look at that Dr. Oz. Uh, right. Dr. I mean, just like the TV just show. Like, right, just I mean, like the TV I, show. I, you wonder, could his TV show sue for copyright right, infringement? Right, exactly. They've done anything. such a good yes. job. Well, I do want to pause and just make one point before we get to our next guest. We're spending a lot of time talking about the Senate races. But Vaughn brought up an important point, which is that Doug Mastriano is someone who was really leading the charge of overturning the election results in Pennsylvania. You think about how critical, how hot these gubernatorial races are going to be because of election integrity, because of abortion rights. It is astonishing to me how essentially the Washington Republican establishment has lost control of the party. Right. The fact that Pennsylvania could be on the verge of not nominating one but two January two. Sixers, uh, essentially, for their top two statewide offices in the single most swingiest battleground state we have we in the country We're both at right the now. rally. It, it is astonishing yeah. that they've allowed this to happen. It just shows you no one's in charge of this party. Well, oh, and, right. and, not, and there are a lot of a jitters here in Washington uh, sure. and on Capitol Hill. Um, we do now want to go to our next guest. We're joined by the Democratic candidate in the Pennsylvania Senate primary, Malcolm Kenyatta. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. And of course, as you know, uh, we have called the race, the uh, presumptive winner for John Fetterman. Um, mm -hmm. Your reaction and will you now endorse him? So, uh, you know, first of all, first and foremost, I'm just going to say thank you to everybody who poured so much into this campaign and helped a poor black gay kid from North Philly become the first openly gay uh, person of color to even be on a ballot for U.S. Senate. And so, you know, we made incredible history and we did it with not the resources that my opponents had. And we knew that there was a tough climb that we had to had a tough hill we had to climb, but we climbed because we know what's at stake. And in this race, we know what's at stake. We don't know yet who the Republican nominee is, but we know that in John Fetterman, um, we're going to have a nominee that is heads and shoulders above whatever full-time resident of Fantasy Island they have on the other side. <laughs> and just as I did for President Biden, and as I did for Democrats all around the Commonwealth, I think I did more events for Democrats running for office than any elected official in Pennsylvania. And if anybody knows Malcolm Kenyatta, I'm going to be out there doing everything we can to make sure we preserve democracy and don't allow it to die on our watch. And allowing any one of these Republicans to become Pennsylvania senator will be the canary in the coal mine for democracy dying on our watch. I won't let it happen. And I don't think any of us will. Neither will um, John Fetterman, who is our nominee. You know, Malcolm Kenyatta, there was a guy, uh, another guy uh, who was challenging the establishment in 2016 who finished third in a Senate primary. And he's now the Democratic nominee today. I've heard of him. <laughs> okay, I say that to you. Do you take some solace in the fact that, hey, you know what? Look, uh, it's, a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You know, John Fetterman took time to get the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania to get to know him. Over time, mm -hmm. they did. Uh, do you see some, do you see some green shoots there when you, when you see Fetterman 16, yourself 22. You know, it's, 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 it's nowhere near over for the movement that we've built. And we've built a movement that is enduring of working class people from every single corner of the Commonwealth who are desperate for a government that works for them up and down the ballot. I mean, I mean, I mean all, all across the Commonwealth, you have people who want to see 
Washington, Harrisburg, their local city council focused on their needs. And so certainly there's going to continue to be a place for my voice in that in that conversation. You know, even on this day where I did not get the victory I wanted in this U.S. Senate race, I was just reelected to my to my house seat. Um, and so folks want me to go back to Harrisburg and continue to fight for them to make sure that Josh Shapiro becomes our next governor, that John Fetterman becomes our next next senator, and that working people do not have an out-of-state, out-of-touch, out-of-their-damn-mind millionaire who thinks they can come to Pennsylvania and buy the seat. They're not going to be able to buy it, and we're not going to yeah. turn over in the place where democracy was born. We're not going to yeah. turn over this democracy to a fascist GOP that's lost its way. Malcolm, let me ask you something that you challenged John Fetterman on during the debates was that 2013 incident when he mm -hmm. chased uh, an African-American man with a gun down the street. Um, he has not officially mm -hmm. apologized. Do you think this could become a super predator moment? In other words, what uh, we saw happen to uh, Hillary Clinton when she was running for president, that became a, a cudgel, something that she couldn't get beyond. Do you think that that mm -hmm. same issue could dog Fetterman in a general election? You know, for anybody who watches, uh, who watched the debates, um, they know where I stand on on that issue. I was clear um, that I thought that the lieutenant governor um, and now our nominee should 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 apologize and certainly. But could it hold um, him back you know, in a general election, Malcolm? Could, could it could it could it hold him back in a general election? Listen, I'm not going to judge anybody against the almighty, okay? This is now a bifurcated choice. The choice is, do we want somebody who I think is going to go to the Senate and cast a vote to raise the minimum wage? Do we want a nominee who's going to go and cast a vote to protect a woman's right to choose? Do I want a nominee who's going to go and make sure my husband, who I just married, we don't have a Supreme Court throw out our right to be married? Or do I want somebody on the other side who who all three of them right now have no business running for the U.S. Senate. And so I'm not going to take any advice from Republicans on anything our nominee should, should, should do. We had a family discussion. John knows where I stand on, on that issue. And again, and of course, I think it would be a nice thing for him to do what I said he should on the debate stage. But now we have a choice, and black voters do not have a friend in Kathy Barnett. Um, as folks say, all skin folk ain't kin folk, and Kathy Barnett certainly is not, and neither is Dr. Oz or, or, or McCormick. And I don't care what bubble vest they put on or if they change their voter registration. All three of them are dangerous, and I'm going to work like hell to defeat them and make sure John Fetterman's the nominee. I mean, the, our right. next senator. All right. Malcolm Kenyatta, thank you so much. Really appreciate it for joining us on this election night. We now want to go to Dasha Burns, who's at the Barnett election night headquarters. Dasha, what are you seeing and hearing there? What's the mood? The mood is enthusiastic. We uh, just watched Kathy Barnett get down a little bit, start to dance with one of her supporters. Uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm and excitement here uh, in this room. election. She actually rose to prominence in the Republican Party on claims of voter fraud, including guys in her own election. She ran for Congress in a heavily blue district and uh, claimed that she lost because of voter fraud. Last night, though, at one of her events that we went to, instead of talking about her loss and, and the reasons she believed that happened, instead she talked about how she lost, but she lost by a much smaller margin than Donald Trump did. Uh, so a bit of a change of messaging there. Uh, here's what's interesting, though. When I talk to voters, uh, you know, we've, we've heard some of the things that she has said in the past, the Islamophobic, homophobic tweets. We um, have been reporting on those images of her uh, on January 6th. But when you talk to voters, there are two things that they bring up. They bring up her stance on abortion, and they bring up the fact that she is an African-American woman. Both, both of these things seem to be motivating the Republican base to come out support Kathy Barnett. They think it's a good thing for the Republican Party, guys. Dasha Burns at the Barnett election night event. Uh, Dasha, thanks very much. We continue to see as actual vote trickles in. You see that race tightening there. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, less than 1,700 votes. 
separate Mr. Madison Cawthorn and Chuck Edwards. We're going to have to check in on that race in a few minutes, but that has gotten super tight mm -hmm. down there in North Carolina. But let's go over to Steve Kornacki. We've got him for a few minutes here at the big board. He's all things Pennsylvania, and he's going to help us explain why we say Mastriano is leading. Not quite too, uh, in a too early to call race. Tell us, Steve. Yeah, well, I, I think it's really interesting because it just follows what we were talking about earlier, which is in Pennsylvania on the Republican side, only a small fraction of the votes are actually going to be cast by mail. And yet what we were seeing for the first 30 or 45 minutes were primarily mail-in ballots. What we're starting to see now is a lot of counties, they don't do this uniformly in Pennsylvania. Some counties choose to release their mail-in votes first, then they get around to the same day. Other counties do the same day, then they get around to the mail. It's it's a mishmash, but the counties that are releasing their same day first, giving you some examples of them just to give you a sense of it. Here's one of them. Mastriano, 52%. You're looking at same day votes here. We're going down to Mastriano. Mean, he's a state senator. This is his political base. But again, you're looking at same day votes here, over 80% here. This is, uh, again, his state Senate district, 80% here. But again, Erie County, this is nowhere near his state Senate district. And yet on the same day vote, here's Mastriano more than two to one over Barletta. So you're seeing that Mastriano color pop up all across the state. And basically, wherever you're seeing that Mastriano color pop up right now, you're seeing same day vote. So he clearly is cleaning up so far in the same day vote. And the same day vote is going to be the vast majority of all votes that get cast in this primary. Now, that's the Mastriano story in the governor's race. Remember, Mastriano's endorsed Barnett. Barnett's endorsed Mastriano. They're hoping to sort of tag team here. Is this carrying over to that Republican Senate primary? Here you go. Oh, now this just got interesting. <laughs> oh, that's Erie County. No wonder it's tied. There we go. Here's the statewide count here on the Republican side. And you can see McCormick with that lead here of about two and a half points uh, over Oz statewide. Again, when we were looking more at mail votes early, McCormick had a wider lead. It's narrowed some. Let's go through some of those counties I was just showing you where we've got same day vote. We've got same day vote in Cambria County and it's Oz. It's Oz who's actually, it's not a ton of votes here, but it's Oz who's actually got the jump on McCormick right there. Let's go down Barnett here. This is, uh, uh, this is you know, we, we were talking about in the governor's race, we saw this. Here's Barnett leading in Fulton County. But it's Oz next door in Franklin County, Mastriano's political base. So it's a bit of a mix right now. If you add up the same day vote that's been that's come in so far in Pennsylvania, the same day vote. Actually, let me get the statewide number up and I can show you the same day vote has been running 31 McCormick, 31 Oz and 24 Barnett. Now, that's not totally evenly distributed geographically, but it's just giving you a sense here. There are some places here. I mean, you could see the Oz red. You could see there are some places where Oz is getting the better of everybody in the same day vote. There are some places, not as many, where Barnett's getting this better uh, on the same day vote. And the McCormick one's a little tougher to read because there's a, still a lot of mail-in ballots that are mixed in there with the McCormick numbers. But again, the key here is like 90% of all the votes in this primary are going to end up being same day day votes and you're looking at a very even distribution right there and remember if it ever comes to it McCormick did get an early leg up it looks like with that small sliver of votes that were cast by mail so we'll continue to keep an eye on that and I'll just quickly update too we'll check in in North Carolina to see if we have uh uh, if we there it is, if we have more on that Cawthorn race, because there was one dynamic that I do think is worth pointing out there. If I just can get it loaded up here, I used to be better at this. Here we go. Cawthorn's within 1,700 votes. The one problem for Cawthorn, he's gotten closer in this thing. What's gotten him closer, though, is it's the counties along the Tennessee border, the rural counties along the Tennessee border, where the same day vote has come in. Cawthorn's done exceptionally well there. Where are there still same day votes to be counted in this district? District. It's Buncombe County and Henderson County, and that's also the political base of Chuck Edwards. He's the state senator challenging Cawthorn here. His political base still has a fair number of same-day votes to be counted, so there's an opportunity on paper. While Cawthorn has more than cut Edwards' lead in half here, he did it in parts of the district that are not familiar with Edwards. The parts of the district that are going to decide this race are the parts of the district that are familiar with Edwards because they've elected him to the state senate. Fascinating there. We will watch. It feels like we're going to have that. That's a race that we're going to have to wait for everything to come in. And the Republican Senate primary is a race and everything. But I'm most uh, focused on one number that you didn't note there, which is 
We still only have 15 percent of the vote in in the Republican Senate primary. Yeah, that's a lot of vote that's sitting out there, Steve. Well, yeah. it's all and it's all same day vote, which is just, you know, to keep in mind everything we saw earlier. That's just the small sliver. And I think you get a sense looking at those Republican gubernatorial numbers, how yeah. much different yeah. those same day votes are going to look. Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. Steve Kornacki, you, fascinating stuff. And you look at that, we've been talking about the tension between the establishment um, and the candidates who are, are either further to the left or to the right. Madison Cawthorn, obviously a flawed candidate. Mm -hmm. um, but Chuck Edwards is someone who was endorsed by Tom Tillis. He has the machine behind him. Well, there's multiple people trying to kill Cawthorn. <laughs> yes, like, that's, that's the issue here. Point. He's made too many. You <laughs> well, know, you can't have too many enemies inside your candidate. own party. Yes. Yeah, there, yes. there's, there's, there's just there's a, a ton lot of, happening. yeah, he, he made way too many political enemies. Yeah, all right, well, we will continue to watch it and come Coming up, we've been talking a lot about what today's contests mean for the state of Trumpism in the Republican Party, but what message should Democrats be walking away with after tonight's results? Two Democratic strategists tell us their big takeaways. That's after a break. Stay with us. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? You know what? Our hearts are ready for something like this. Yeah. It's a great workout. It's yeah. everything Actually, you need. What comes back together? Oh, I'm so, so happy. I that's what it takes to set a record. So glad to see you. Would it be easier for the airlines to manage a vaccine mandate than a mask mandate? Is there a case to be made that it's time to give Ukraine offensive weapons so they can win this war? What should be focused on that could reduce inflation and avoid a recession? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, it's here now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. These are families trying to board those trains to Poland. I also want to get home. You'll get home. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Right now on Morning News Now. We're coming on the air with breaking news. And this is a significant moment. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, NBC News, streaming free now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. You've got a whole restart. How does that land with you? Is climate change and the environment one of your top priorities? Sounds so good. I love it. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back. Tonight's results may come from just five states, but they could tell us a lot about what the electorate in the general election could look like this year. That's right. For Republicans, it sure looks like the party of Lincoln remains the party of Trump. As for Democrats, it appears the brand of politics Joe Biden rode to victory on less than two years ago may not be where the party remains in 2022. And we're just getting a statement from President Biden sent out by the DNC. Pennsylvania, basically yes. his other home state. That's right. right? His After other Delaware, home state. The Pennsylvania. That's he, right. He loved him some 
from Connor Lamb. He sure does. Yeah. Uh, but he just put a statement out uh, praising the fact that John Fetterman has now won. He says, as Pennsylvania's lieutenant governor, John Fetterman understands that working class families in Pennsylvania and across the country have been dealt out for far too long. It's time to deal them back in and electing John to the United States Senate would be a big step forward for Pennsylvania's working people. Not a surprise, mm -hmm. obviously. And I've said it before, but it bears repeating. The White House really views Pennsylvania as its best chance for a pickup. They signaled this sort of pull away a little bit from Connor Lamb a few months ago when they said, hey, right. you know, we think either Connor Lamb or John Fetterman can be strong. That's right. They saw the polling. That's they saw right. where this was headed. They said it, they saw where it was headed, and yeah. they're not surprised, but uh, the general has already begun mm -hmm. for the White House. With us now is Fai Shakur, advisor to Bernie Sanders and founder of More Perfect Union, and Sarah Chamberlain, Republican strategist and president and CEO of the Republican Main Street Partnership. Thanks to both of you for being here. Uh, your reaction to John Fetterman winning, not a surprise. He supported uh, Senator Sanders in 2016, obviously someone who you have spent a lot of time with working with. Um, he's tacking a little bit to the center. Not a surprise either, given that he's eyeing the general now. Well, I mean, in the language, he's talked about being a working class candidate. I mean, he mm -hmm. talks really about bread and butter issues and d defines himself. And sometimes on the social issues, it really doesn't go down the road of what many others in the party have, have gotten sucked into. So you see him really carving an identity that works in Pennsylvania. He's a well-known statewide actor. Really good win, for I think, for the progressives in the Democratic Party. Sarah, it's been a tough night for... Uh I would say Main Street Republicans. Sure mm. has. I mean, Pat McCrory, I, I, look, Pat McCrory is his former mayor of Charlotte. I, you know, he got a reputation for being very conservative. He would, his defenders would argue it was his legislature that mm -hmm. sort of tagged him a little bit uh, on this front. Um, but there was no room for a Mitt Romney Republican, was, which is used as a pejorative mm -hmm. against him. It was amazing. What was really amazing is not that he lost, but by the margin he lost by. Mm. I, mean, I, I did not see that coming. Um, I do think there's a potential that that could go uh, Democratic down there. You know, we study at Main Street, we study suburban areas, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see if, if uh, the Republican can hold the suburban areas, especially around Charlotte in, Montgomery, in the county. Yeah, so. and, and when you look at a state like Pennsylvania, Sarah, and you think about the suburban areas, obviously, yeah. which are going to be critical to winning a general election. Uh, which candidate, because we're tracking a very close race mm -hmm. in the Republican primary right now, which candidate do you think is the strongest? Because you have the White House kind of saying any three of them. Mm. Um, I don't they think they believe, want McCormick. They, they, yeah, McCormick yeah, right. would Barnett be tougher. Barnett or Oz, I that, think. Yeah. Fair right. point, yeah. fair yeah. point. It would be tougher. But they, they think Barnett is absolutely a walk. Correct. But other people say it's more complicated. What do you think? I think it's probably a walk if she wins. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Oz, I think, can carry this. And, uh, and I think the suburban women especially would vote for him. I don't think the polling is quite showing that, but they know him. They know him well. They watch his TV shows. Mm -hmm. and, this, and the polling that we've done shows that if, if it's the two of them, they will vote for Oz. As, I, I, I had a, a colleague basically ask, are Democrats rooting for the more extreme candidates to win these primaries? Are you as a strategist, a for you know, and I say this like, do you want a, a Madison, <laughs> you want a Madison Cawthorn out there, the Kathy Barnett's mm. out there, the Ted Buds, um, is it better than the I, Pat McCrory or, or Chuck Edwards? I remember, I'm old enough to remember yeah. in the 2016, yeah. 2015 cycle and many Democrats, not among them, but many Democrats, oh, it would be great if Trump got the nomination. Right. Well, you have to live with the outcome if you get somebody who is an extreme who, who happens to be one of two candidates at the, at the general state. It's a binary choice. It's, it's yeah. not, not a great situation to be in. So I don't root for radical people to have the nomination because the, the, there's real danger that they could actually hold office and take us down a direction that I'm actually quite fearful but, of. You know, that's really true, and they can't govern. I mean, that's what Main Street, we believe in getting the right candidate through the election that can actually govern. But the public doesn't, you know, this is something that's, I think, you know, they don't trust anybody that's been in office. That's true. You know, I, I thought the, Pat McCrory's biggest problem was his first name was governor. I think Connor Lamb's biggest problem mm -hmm. was his first name was congressman. Mm -hmm. You know, now, Pat McCrory tried to make Ted Budd being a congressman, hey, this is Washington right. people. It just didn't ring. You're right about the governing issue, but the public doesn't seem to care. And, and I don't understand that. With everything that's going on, with the problems in this country, with inflation, war, all of this, like, we need to care. And I think the biggest problem that's facing this country is the lack of turnout in primaries. I was just going to say the same yeah. thing. That's the big story that. to come out. Yeah, there you go. We agree <laughs> on something. Look at, like, the depressed state yeah. of yeah. people coming out of the pandemic 
living yeah. difficult lives. Are you in a good lived, mood? Yeah, uh, I mean, 75% yeah. of the people, according to your own yeah. poll, right. wrong track. In We're all country. in a bad mood. I think that there's a danger of people feeling the government has become discredited in their yes. minds. Well, it is no longer useful or you, yeah. has any utility in their life. But, but, Do you think the fact that this leaked Supreme Court document, which shows that the Supreme Court may be poised to overturn Roe v. Wade, we've seen it potentially be a game changer in the Pennsylvania primary. It's part of Kathy Barnett's last-minute surge. But do you think that that has an impact on turnout, if not in the primary I, in the general? I, you know, I, I think it's an important issue. I think people have strong feelings on it. I happen to be a very strong supporter of choice. I believe that, like, 60 percent of people who are. And so I, you know, I think it could, but generally I'm, I'm skeptical. Uh, and I saw today, you know, actually in one of the new North Carolina races where one of the candidates, a de Democrat, beats another Democrat with a, you know, an anti-choice platform, mm. somebody who was opposed mm. to and, and a lot of the abortion groups uh, went after him in a Democratic primary, and he won. Don Davis uh, beat Erica Smith. Sarah, what do you take? What is the way in in stopping the Trump wing of the party? Voting in primaries. We you, have to get that 70 percent in the middle to turn out and vote in primaries. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just not doing it. They're staying quiet, quiet. They're sitting home. They're complaining. But they are not voting. And until we can motivate them, the Main Street type Republicans, to vote, I had it in my own family. But Brad like, McCrory tried to call himself the Ron DeSantis before Ron DeSantis. And in a weird way, and, and, and this play. is what I heard from people about David McCormick like, don't be somebody you're not. Right? right. McCormick right. tried to be Trumpy, and there was like, yeah. you're not Trumpy. Yeah, you're not Trumpy. Enough. McCrory right. knew he wasn't Trumpy, and then at the end, I guess, gave it a shot too. Voters sniff that out, don't they? They do sniff that out. And that's why we lost in North Carolina. Well, and it's about authenticity. If you look at a John Fetterman, I think people that's who supported true. him would say he's authentic. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and I think that this, uh, again, going back to who, what animates you? Why are you running for office? And, and, and when people say, I'm going to fight for working families, a lot of people will say that. The question is, do they believe you? Right. And when John Fetterman says that, and then you watch him campaign and you watch him operate, like, yeah, I believe that guy. Yeah. Give him a shot. And I think that's why he's going to carry the state. Okay. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what the suburban women do in the general election it, in Pennsylvania. As it so often does, it is going to come down to the suburban women. It sure is. Right. Bucks County area. That's right. Yeah. Thanks to both of you. Great conversation. Right. Oh, That's nice. right. <laughs> Foz and Sarah, thank you. And tonight is just the start of the 2022 primary season. After the break, I'll go to the board here. Well, the preview of some other big races we already have our eyes on this year and, frankly, later this month. You're streaming Election Night coverage from Meet the Press right here on NBC News Now. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from the ground zero as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get a hand. When was the last time you made space to listen to somebody? What I learned from a very young age is radical love, radical forgiveness. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It showed a lot of personal strength for me. Why am I trying to make other people happy over myself? So many life lessons that are going on in these conversations. We're watching a transformation. Join Hoda Kotb for her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. NBC News, streaming free now. We will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Women's basketball has been systematically held back after 49 years of Title IX, and we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. When was the last time you made space to listen to somebody? We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. I think you're going to be blown away by the life lessons. Join Hoda Kotb for her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas is your news playlist on NBC News Now. And now, you can listen to it as a podcast. Available anytime and anywhere.
And NBC News now has another projection that we can make. In the race for Pennsylvania's next governor, Doug Mastriano has won uh, the primary, the Republican primary there. Of course, Mastriano was endorsed in recent days by former President Trump. Uh, he is a state senator in Pennsylvania, defeating his nearest rival, Lou Barletta. This is not a surprise. Uh, this is a candidate who was at the January 6th rally. He led the efforts to try to overturn the election results in Pennsylvania. He now becomes the Republican nominee for governor in Pennsylvania. And Chuck, with that, I'm going to toss it over to you we'll, at the big board. We'll see if he has any coattails for Kathy Barnett there. Still a lot yeah. there. All right. We know we have five states tonight. Let me take you through them really quick. You know the five. We've been focused a lot on Pennsylvania, North Carolina. The polls haven't closed yet in Idaho and Oregon, but they'll be closing at 11 o'clock Eastern. Interesting primary for governor in Idaho. Will the incumbent win and win comfortably. A couple of House races in Oregon that we're watching closely, including one where an incumbent could lose in Kurt Schrader. But let me take you through the rest of the primary calendar, at least through the 4th of July. So this week we had five states. Next week we have four more states. You got Alabama and Georgia. Talk about Trump tests. We're going to get a whole bunch of Trump tests in here in those two states. Alabama has some runoffs that we think are going to end up happening in the governor's race and the Senate race. It is just everything is, is going to be constantly too close to call there. We will see if Governor Kemp does breeze to his uh, new nomination there in Georgia. So that's next week. Texas has a runoff. Uh, the one we're watching the closest, of course, Henry Cuellar, member of Congress on the border there. Jessica Cisneros challenging him from the left. Uh, now let me take you to a couple weeks later, June 7th. It's a huge primary day. You'll see here you got states, uh, seven states. Iowa's got some interesting Senate primaries that we're keeping an eye on and some House primaries there. New Mexico's competitive governor's race that we're keeping an eye on. So it would be probably our most voters voting on any one night, considering that we have California there. And then uh, one more primary night in, the, in June, June 14th, Maine, Nevada, North Dakota, and South Carolina. Um, will be interesting to see some of the primaries in South Carolina, Maine, the second congressional district, always very competitive there. And then Nevada, we expect more. Nevada is going to be a huge state for us in November. Most of the primaries are likely to be decided, but still worth watching to see who some of the congressional nominees are going to be. So we've got a busy couple of months before we celebrate our Independence Day on the 4th of July. We're going to get a whole bunch of primaries in. We're looking forward to it. We certainly are. And of course, we'll continue to watch these themes, uh, the mm -hmm. establishment versus the outsider. Absolutely. In these races. Speaking of establishment. Yeah, exactly. With that, we want to go to former North Carolina Republican Governor Pat McCrory. Our NBC News Decision Desk, of course, projected that he will come up short in the race for North Carolina's Republican <laughs> Senate nomination. Governor, we appreciate your joining us. So good to see you. You're a happy good warrior, brother. You, friend. <laughs> I see that. You look like you, a happy warrior. You sure are, Governor. Yeah, Let I, me ask I've, you. I've, I've compared myself to Jason Bourne from the Bourne Identity. <laughs> okay. All right. Now. <laughs> you and six, that David, six, huh? years, six years ago, the left says I was a radical right-wing extremist, and now this year I'm called by my own party a, uh, a, a liberal rhino. So, um, but so I, you I just tell us. My you. You know, no, Pat, you tell us. Yeah. You're, five years from now, you look back, what happened? What are you going to say? I think two things would happen. One is there's no doubt that when President uh, Trump, during our Republican convention, state Republican convention, with me in the audience, said the following, that I don't represent our values. That was, I remember sitting at the table on my boy, something's changed here. And maybe that's true. Maybe I don't represent uh, President Trump's values. I, I mainly represented his um, policies, except for I was, I'm more conservative on fiscal spending than uh, President Trump. But I, I think when that happened, I went, wow, this, this has changed when a former president says, I don't represent the values of the people in that room. That really changed. And the second thing is when I saw that the Club for Growth um, mm. put in $15 million, which their main point was to call me a rhino and change my brand or change my passport. I, I when we were we were outspent fifteen to one yeah. uh, by an outside group and 
that's hard to when they rebrand you last night i saw a commercial against me saying i raised the gas tax which is totally false well but, and you know people believe it and governor chuck and i have been talking about that all night the fact that uh, ted budd had the backing of not just former President Trump, but also the Club for Growth, that avalanche of ads and money that was poured into his race. So I have to ask you, are you going to endorse him now? Are you going to campaign with him? Will you support him? Well, you know what I need to do? That's a great question. What I need to do is get assurances from the current leaders in my state party that I haven't been canceled. Because mm. for the past 13 months, months, I've been told I'm a Republican in name only. Mm. Well... I need them to correct that. Now, maybe they didn't mean it and said it just to win the primary, or if they meant it, uh, I got to do some reevaluation because they not only said I was Republican name only, they said I wanted conservative. And I consider myself a pretty conservative guy. So it's not really about me, though. It's about the 30, uh, whatever, 27% of people vote against me because this is going to be a very close general election. So I think my party, in order to win the general election, has still got to appeal to the conservatives like me, the Ronald Reagan conservative, right. in order to win North Carolina. So, you know, if they come back to me and, and my supporters and say, hey, you're really a you're really you're a part of the Republican Party. You're an important role. Not me personally. My ego doesn't need that. Right. But, you know, you can run negative ads or inaccurate and false ads against me. But to do kind of a McCarthyism within our yeah. own party, saying some people belong and other people don't belong, man, we better correct that or we're, we're not going to win the U.S. Senate or the White yeah. House in uh, 24. I'm old enough to remember when, you, when, when a Republican like yourself could become the mayor of Charlotte. You know Mecklenburg County. Can Ted Budd compete in Mecklenburg County? Uh, probably not Mecklenburg County. I'm, uh, although I, I did win Mecklenburg County in the primary, which I'm, I'm, I'm glad I won Charlotte Mecklenburg in the Republican primary tonight. But uh, lately, uh, re the urban centers are blue right now. The question mm -hmm. is not losing the urban centers by a lot. Um, that's the big issue. And, and North Carolina is a purple state. I mean, uh, Tom Tillis won by 40,000 votes out of over 4 million, mm. and that was a, with a flawed Democrat. So uh, the Republicans are going to have to work hard here, and that's why every Republican vote will count and every Democrat vote yeah. counts. Listen, I want the Republican majority uh, yeah. for the Democratic, I mean, for, uh, for the Republican Party. But... I think we've got to have a little more courage in reaching out and not being so wrapped up in one individual. And uh, right. I'm not afraid to say it. Governor no, Pat not. McCrory, we really appreciate your candor and we appreciate your joining us on a very busy election night for you. Thank you. Campaigns go up, campaigns go down. He knows that mm -hmm. uh, pretty well. He, he, he sounded like a happy yeah. warrior there. It's never sure easy. Did. Appreciate him spending a few minutes with us. Coming up, what tonight could tell us about the issues voters want to see on the ballot this November. Is it really about issues or is it about persona? You're streaming election night with Meet the Press right here on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Ukraine and Russia. Could you help me understand what's going on? So to help make sense of it, we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. The fire has grown a leaps and bounds. What you see behind me is typical. How you doing? Well, um, pretty, pretty bad. When was the last time you made space to listen to somebody? What I learned from a very young age is radical love, radical forgiveness. We are meeting people one after the next who have made profound changes. It showed a lot of personal strength for me. Why am I trying to make other people happy over myself? So many life lessons that are going on in these conversations. We're watching a transformation. Join Hoda Kotb for her podcast, Making Space. Listen now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand, so we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. 
live from Ukraine, from Mayfield, Kentucky, from Waukesha, Wisconsin. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. I also want to get home. You'll get home. You'll get home. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand, so we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We're here to start conversations about the big things happening in our world. Because it's not my job to tell you what to think. My job is to think about what you tell me. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, it's here now. News is happening now. Look at what's making headlines around the world. Whenever it happens, wherever you are, it's here now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand, so we've created a newscast just for them. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Making Space, the inspirational podcast from Hoda Kotb. Listen now. Welcome back. As we've mentioned, we're keeping an eye on the issues that matter most to voters in tonight's midterm races and how those issues are shaping November's most crucial contest. And we understand if some of you think issues, do people <laughs> care about issues anymore? Well, according to our latest NBC poll, nothing matters more to voters right now than the cost of living. More than a fifth of Americans say it is the top issue. But abortion has surged more so than any other issue in importance in recent weeks after the bombshell Supreme Court leak revealed that Roe v. Wade likely be overturned in June. That did seem to surge things a bit. Today's results could give us a first look into how the abortion issue plays at the polls. And we're going to be following it over the next couple mm -hmm. of weeks as well. I particularly am interested in that runoff in Texas where the issue on a Democratic primary, where we're going to have Henry Cuellar, a self-described pro-life Democrat. That's right. Jessica Cis Cisneros, a uh, pro-choice Democrat there. Back with us, Joshua Johnson, host of Now Tonight on NBC News Now. Also with us, Mark Caputo, national political reporter for NBC News, and Natasha Karecki, senior national political reporter. For NBC News. Uh, let me start with uh, you, Natasha. You've been covering Pennsylvania a while. Uh, it does look like that Oz is benefiting from Trump's political mm -hmm. machine, which is quite strong in Pennsylvania, probably more so than many other battleground states. Right. It, it is interesting, but we should still look at this Barnett surge as sort of a telltale sign here. And, and, and some of the things I, th I think are fascinating, the, the spending, um, so little spending. I mean, a lot of convention has gone out the window. Um, certainly, Oz has benefited from Trump. Um, but one thing I will also note with Barnett is this uh, real grassroots um, surge she saw over social media. I, I thought it was really interesting. There was this report, uh, this uh, this report about the interactions on Facebook, and Barnett just had interactions through the roof without spending a lot of money, um, right. and she actually sur started surpassing Oz at one point. So we have seen some grassroots uh, really lifting her up here, and I think that's something to watch uh, looking down the road. And Joshua, when you hear from a number of Democrats in Pennsylvania, they dismiss Oz, they dismiss Barnett in a general election. Is that a mistake? I mean, could a candidate Oz be a force to be reckoned with, particularly with the backing of former President Trump in the purple state of Pennsylvania? I mean, I don't see why not. I think that the thing to note about Kathy Barnett that kind of helped her out is that she's she's just interesting. The story she told about her mother <laughs> yeah. being raped right. and then yes. choosing to have her and then saying, I wasn't a clump of cells then, I'm not a clump of cells now, and justifying her anti-abortion stance that way is interesting. John Fetterman is interesting. 
He wears a hoodie, he wears cargo shorts, the bald head, the beard, he looks like an orc. He's an interesting political character. And I think in a lot of these races where you're just trying to appeal to the base, especially for Democrats, who are worried about the impact that Republicans will have on the country, I think you just need to start by grabbing people's attention. I agree with Abraham Lincoln. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Without mm -hmm. public sentiment, nothing can succeed. And John Fetterman, over the years, has built a national profile that people react to. I'm not sure that for all that Malcolm Kenyatta brings to the table, he plays as well as an openly mm -hmm. gay black man speaking as one. I would love to know if there were any voters mm -hmm. who maybe were turned off by that a little right. bit. Further away you get from the Delaware River, closer to like Bluebell right. and Plymouth Meeting and Doylestown mm -hmm. and on and on west. I'm just not sure that that plays as well for people, and I'm just not sure he grabbed the attention of Pennsylvanian voters as much as John Fetterman already has. Joshua, you will never go wrong saying the words, I agree with Abraham Lincoln. There you go. <laughs> That's right. That's Mark why Caputo. I said it. There you go. Mark Caputo, uh, you cover uh, Team Trump pretty closely. Uh, it's I uh, part of the, the home turf of where you're based out of, uh, the Trump uh, machine. Uh, it certainly lives down there in South Florida. What are they, how are they viewing tonight? And, mm. and are they pleased that they may be able to bail Oz out? Does that tell them that their machine is functioning in the Keystone State? I don't think Trump really has a machine. By the way, it's not fair I have to follow Joshua. He had an orc <laughs> reference as well as Abraham Lincoln. He's going to kill you every time. <laughs> back, to, back to Trump. So it's not really a machine. Trump is a cult. And what you've generally found and what other pollsters and consultants have found is that if Trump endorses you, you get a five-point bounce in the polls, especially in a, pro a crowded primary, which Oz did, and you get like a 10-point improvement on your image rating. That's really good. And with Oz, yes, he's a TV figure, and that's important because he was in people's living rooms. It's pro-transgender rights. Uh, yeah. He said positive things about Anthony Fauci. He said positive things about the way China handled the COVID lockdowns. Like most Republicans in today's Republican Party would be buried, uh, but Oz has enough of a positive residual image rating from a show, and he had the Trump endorsement, and that's why he is where he is today. And then Trump came in and endorsed Mastriano. He knew Mastriano was catching fire. Speaking of someone who has a cult, like following Mastriano does. There's people who come up to him at these meetings. They'll touch him as if he's some sort of religious figure. It's really interesting. Uh, Trump saw that, was attracted to it, and he got enough, let's say, grief in backing Oz that he decided, well, I'm going to back Mastriano as well. Oz might lose. I'll have one and one. Looks like right now he might go two and zero oh in Pennsylvania. We started this segment by talking about the, the issues that will energize voters, and one of them is undoubtedly abortion. And uh, Natasha, you know, Oz was critiqued um, by his rivals as not being clear and always absolutist on the issue of abortion. How do you think abortion plays in the general, particularly in a place like Pennsylvania? It, it, I think this is something that Democrats are really ch trying to seize on. I mean, most obviously, you know, as we saw from the poll numbers, but what Democrats are trying to do, and this is not new, but it, it, it's, it's especially pointed now, which is pushing some of these candidates to the extreme in the primary bringing it out because the DGA and others are, are having ads um, right, right now meddling in some of these primaries, um, making sure everyone knows, and then hoping that when you get to the general in these swing states, in purple states, in Nev places like Nevada, in places like Wisconsin, in places like Pennsylvania, you're going to have, you're, you're seeing this dynamic where you have you have the Republican candidates going pretty far right, and you you have Democrats who are looking down the road and just like salivating and hoping that this right. this plays out the way that they they hope it will play out. Um, so I mean that's something that I think they're they're really trying to seize on. Um, but so many of these races we have seen, uh, you know, what right. you say doesn't matter later on. You you can you yeah. can somehow erase it if you can latch on to some mm. other idea. Or um, you know, even viral video and Joshua, we we we've had the uh, luxury of interviewing not one but two losing primary candidates tonight: <laughs> Malcolm Kenyatta and the Democratic side of things in Pennsylvania, and Pat McCrory on the Republican side of things in North Carolina. Malcolm Kenyatta was already ready to get behind Fetterman. Yeah. He was basically, "I'll lead the charge if necessary." Viewing the opposition is that bad. What was fascinating about Pat McCrory is he felt character assassinated. 
by this version yeah. of the Republican Party and the Club for Growth. And, and that is sort of how Trump world works, right? When they come after you, it's ugly. Um, I don't know if this is an election where you can afford division on your side of the aisle. Yeah, and I think, you know, Malcolm Kenyat is young. He's 31 years old. He's an up-and-coming mm -hmm. politician. I took your question, Chuck, to him very clearly, where, you know, there was just a guy who was third before, and now he's, yeah. he's going on. So I think that's... You saw where I, I was going. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that's kind of the right outlook to, to have. I totally understand why Governor McCrory felt a little bit stabbed in the back by his own party, mm -hmm. but that's the way that the party is going right now. I also think the strategy for Democrats is going to be very much quality of life. We've got Oregon going to the polls tonight. Two-thirds mm. of Oregonians, according to an Oregon public broadcasting poll, say they felt that the economy was poor or very poor. Eight percent of residents of Portland said the city's doing well. But Oregon's unemployment is 3.8 percent. Its underemployment is 7.4 percent, a record low. And Oregon yeah. added jobs last year faster than just about any other state. So for Democrats, if they want to succeed, unity is the least of their problems. They're going to have mm -hmm. to convince voters that what they are seeing is either not as bad as they think it is or easier to fix with Democrats in office than with Republicans. Those are tall orders, and they're going to need all the unity they yep. can get. Yeah. Great final thoughts by all of you. Joshua, Mark, Natasha, really great to be with you this evening. Of all the issues we discussed, Chuck, inflation, the economy at the top of the list. It is. Oregon is going to be wild. There's going to be a, a third-party candidate in that yeah. governor's race. Uh, that's going to be something else. All right, we've got to go. This has been terrific election coverage. It has. Stick around. We will have all of the results for you. Uh, follow NBC News wherever you follow NBC News. Have a great night. And you can stream Morning News now at 7 a.m. Eastern. I'll be back on Meet the Press Daily on MSNBC tomorrow at 1. Tonight, President Biden.